Welcome to the Lip Lorn Porn Prom Com. Welcome. We talk like lots and we talk like good. We so talk good. Welcome to the Leaf. I don't know about you, but I talk line. pretty darn good. Hi, everyone. Professional speaker here, Brian Ralston, and across from me is that Benakina guy. And we're glad you're joining us for Leafline, the podcast on episodes 6,027 and 10. We don't like grammar, but we do like emails. So write to us at centenary1911 at gmail.com, or as the cool people pronounce it, Gmail. No one says that, Ben. Updates. Updates. Right? Can I get an update? Updates. We have updates. I have three. Do you want to say any of them? Uh, you can go right ahead and start, and I'll sure I'll chime in. So. Okay, so first off, this Sunday, October 25th, we are reopened for in-person services, assuming some new information has not come out today to prevent that from happening. But if the state does not turn purple again, which I've heard states can do, if the state does not turn purple, we will have a traditional service in the sanctuary at 9 a.m. this Sunday. 9 a.m. will be the new time for the traditional service, and we hope you come. Uh, all the typical protocol rules apply. You're going to get temperature checked at the door. They're going to ask you for the, the checklist. Have you had a fever in the last 48 hours or whatever it is? Brian, were you going to say so something? So caveat to, to this, when we say traditional or modern contemporary, those labels don't mean a lot right now because we still cannot sing inside, and so there will not be any congregational worship in the sense of singing hymns or singing modern worship songs. So don't let that label either it get you fired up to be worshiping or not because it's, we're not going to be able to do that, just so you know. So 9 o'clock in the sanctuary is the sanctuary service, and the theme will be... Traditional leaning, but no congregational worship. There's going to be an organ piece. There's going to be piano music playing right. in there. But that'll be the one in the sanctuary at 9 a.m. At 10.30 a.m., we will be doing a modern worship set in the courtyard. If you want to come to that and do the modern worship with us, we will be standing. There won't be chairs provided because we're not spending a ton of time there. Because after that modern worship segment at probably around 11 a.m., we're going to move into the, the FC, the Fellowship Center, for the family service which will be at uh, around 11 a.m. But if you're coming to that one, I hope you'll join us for the modern worship in the courtyard immediately before that. However, that evening on October 25th at 5.30 p.m., we are having a traditional hymn sing in the courtyard. And Jennifer Perrier will be leading vocal hymns in the courtyard. Lyrics will be provided. Jenner Swanson will be playing the accompaniment for that. And that'll be great. If you haven't, let us know. It's really helpful to the leadership to know that you are attending that thing. So if you are attending, please email us at centenary1911 at gmail.com, and we'll know that you're going to be there. Next Saturday, however, the Saturday after October 25th is October 31. We are still having that Halloween carnival walkthrough in the courtyard of Centenary. We definitely need candy donations for that as we've needed for our Halloween events in years past. And we need volunteers to run the booths, to hang out with the community, to just generally be welcoming and awesome to people on campus. If you've got kids or grandkids in your life and you wanna bring them to this event, that's fantastic. But in general at Centenary, we are looking at this event as more of a, an outreach to the community than in something that we are trying to do to entertain our, our beloved church family. We're hoping our church family partners with us in this ministry to the outside community, especially to the students of Stanford Elementary School. Brian, have I been so, babbling long enough? Nah, you've been babbling a lot. So if you're missing in-person things at Centenary, you got three opportunities here. So Sunday morning, Sunday evening, that's coming Sunday, the 25th of October, and then mm -hmm. Saturday, the 31st, a great opportunity to serve and to love on our neighborhood, uh, socially distanced and masked and all that good stuff. But if you are still not comfortable going out for worship, there will be an online service still Sunday morning as normal, 9 a.m. There will be traditional and modern worship uh, packages also available online. So all of that is still available as it's been every Sunday. We'll still continue that even with the in-person. Because we understand some of you are not quite ready to be in person yet. We want to respect that and love you. And so thus... All is going to be available this Sunday. Yeah, thank you, Brian. I should have mentioned that. That is true. Uh, it, it'll be a long time before we do not have an online service available every Sunday. Recommendations. Give it a try. Brian, Hi. would you like to go first by informing the audience of yes. what you're reading and what you're watching? So I do the audio books quite a bit. And so right now I, I'm uh, weirdly listening to three different memoir biography type books. 
um, one of which is Alex Trebek, and that's really interesting. And so if you happen to like Jeopardy or just like good stories, he has a fascinating life story. And so it's called The Answer Is, and the audiobook does have him reading parts of it. Despite his current battle with pancreatic cancer, he does read a couple sections of the book himself, which is kind of cool. So if you're into audiobooks, that's a good one to check out. The Answer Is by Alex Trebek. That I'm, guy, sorry, yeah. are you going to move on no, to the no. next book? No, no, yeah, but talk about Alex Trebek. He's that guy has right snuck now. up on me in the last few years, and I've started to realize that in the same way that in adult life, I realized how much I love Mr. Rogers. Yeah. Like, holy cow, Alex Trebek, What he's just a benchmark of television. He's almost on the Mount Rushmore of television, it seems, and the way that he's handled his illness publicly, and he's just awesome. Yeah, he like, he has been quite the hero in some ways for any of us who have gone through cancer because his his battle with cancer has been horrific and incredibly difficult. Pancreatic cancer is vicious and incredibly painful, and he's continued to work as best he can through it. And, you know, it's not a good, great prognosis, but so far, you know, he's 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 still there. And the book tells his whole life story, but it definitely gives a better understanding of who he is and why he can be so strong and courageous now is because of the family he came from, the background, and it's just interesting. So if you have an interest in that, the audiobook's really good. Um, most of the narration is some other dude, but Alex Trebek does narrate parts of it. Don't you like my descriptive, I don't remember it's the very narrator's name. Uh, I'm also reading two other bio- autobiographies, I guess, technically. Um, one is, and I ha- I cannot recommend them because they definitely are not uh, for children. They're adult content. Oh, they have some naughty, naughty words? words. They, have some, they have some naughty words, yeah. One is called uh, Born a Crime, which is Trevor Noah. If you know anything about his background, very interesting backstory to him, and he's just a fascinating character, and I'm still reading that one. And then uh, a dude who Ben probably knows from Saturday Night Live, Colin Jost. His his book is called A Very Punchable Face, and it's so far very interesting, but also, yeah, not for the tame at heart when it comes to some of the language. So I'll keep you posted, but those two I'm not quite recommending, but, you know, they're interesting. Um, I do not have any recommendations this week, but I've been watching some amusing things. Uh, so Kristen found a newer, I think it was made in 2018, film adaptation of King Lear, it stars Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson, which is not the first time we've seen those two on screen together. Um, and it's just reminding me that Shakespeare is one sick dude. <laughs> like, the stuff, wow. This is true. So, yes. Quite the... Yeah, uh, I, I love Shakespeare. I've never read King Lear before, but um, I'm a big fan of Twelfth Night and yeah, a couple of his other ones. So that's been an interesting journey. Um, really, really well performed Some of the directorial decisions are kind of strange. Um, But, yeah, we've been sort of enjoying that one. It's just a really, really dark play. Uh, Last night, Kristen and I started watching Return of the Pink Panther, starring Ah. the great and powerful Peter Sellers. Nothing goes with King Lear better than Pink Panther, yes. It's just Peter Peter Sellers is so gifted. Awesome. He's just amazing. And uh, we we got through the first 30 minutes of that last night before bedtime, and just I'm really looking forward to watching that with her. I, I feel a sense of accomplishment when I pick the right movie that Kristen hasn't really seen before, ah. but I know she's going to enjoy. You've done good and on I was that just one. thinking, wow, this this is her. This is for her. Yeah, and yeah, those, those are good. If you haven't seen those in a while, like you know, take a take a. They're not view all created equal. Not no, all of, those of course movies, not. But, but there's even just a bunch of great YouTube clips of the Pink Panther mm-hmm. films. So that's all I'm saying for what I've been reading and what I'm watching. I'm not giving it a try, but your give it a try is the uh, Trebek book. Yeah. There will be a link for that in the description below this video if you want to check it out, and I hope you do. Raise a glass to something. Raise a glass to time uh, Would you like to go first or shall I? Uh, let me go first. Okay. Because mine is more, yeah, church-wide, I guess. So, uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and those of you who also might remember, October is also a Pastor Bob Collins birthday occasion. So if you haven't had a chance to drop Pastor Bob and Cheryl a card recently, uh, feel free to do that. We want to encourage you to stay in touch with Pastor Bob and Cheryl. It's okay if you reach out to them, drop them a card, a birthday card, or a Pastor Appreciation card. Obviously, we are going to be doing um, some other things for Pastor Tim and Gina as part of this. And we officially. hope you appreciate them too. But yes. Yeah. But I'm specifically calling out the opportunity for Pastor Bob and Cheryl just to make you aware it's okay to do that. And if, especially and if you just want to drop my birthday card, even that would be, that'd be fine as well. So Pastor Bob and Cheryl got a lot of 
uh, well wishes right around the time of Pastor Bob's retirement. They appreciated and loved all of that stuff. But one of the things that we who have been through a grief process know is that you get a lot of good support up front, but six months later, you know, a year later, yeah. the pain can still exist. And Pastor Bob served this church for 22 years. Yep, 22 years. Um, that, that is a tattoo that does not wash off quickly. He right. He loved this church family. He served his heart out. And you might not be aware of this, but the guidelines of the United Methodist Conference, which this church is a part of, prohibit pastors from returning and visiting their former churches. There's just some very strict guidelines about letting the new pastor have some space to develop his ministry to the church. And Pastor Bob is obeying that. You on our end, on the congregant end, don't have to. So you are perfectly free to reach out to Pastor Bob and Cheryl, and I know they would appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. So Pastor Prudence Month, Pastor Bob's birthday, raise a glass to Bob and Cheryl and here, here. take Clean an opportunity to do that. Yeah. And my raise a glass this week is for a uh, significantly younger man uh, who I knew when he was a very young man indeed. This goes out to Jeff Jacobs, uh, who I first knew when I came here about 10 years ago as a high school student. I think he was a senior at the time in Centenary Church's youth group. Shortly after that, he became my bass student. Shortly after that, he became an extremely faithful and valuable musician on our worship teams here and just played innumerable Sundays, Sundays without number, uh, eventually expanded his acumen to learn electric guitar, started getting really good at that. And just on a personal level, I, I love this kid. He's a good guy, and um, we're really going to miss him around here. Now that we're reopening and able to play some music opportunities, I was really looking forward to uh, having him involved there. But his career is calling him southward. He has uh, recently accepted a full-time position in his career field in San Bernardino County, and I cannot express how thrilled I am for him to be starting this journey of his life. So it's bittersweet because I'm super happy for him, but uh, we're going to miss him around here. Yeah. So that's Jeff. Jeff. a good good kid, grew up in the church, and has been a part of Centenary long for a long history time. here, much longer than mine. Yes, and so Centenary will miss him and uh, raise a glass to that fine young man as God leads him on to something else and more adventures and, yeah, so, do well, Jeffrey. We'll miss you. Godspeed, Jeffrey. Trivia. On to the category of trivia. Last week's question was TV dogs. And I'm astonished to say, Mr. Brian, we received zero responses to this question. I thought this one was a softball right over the middle of the plate. Is that baseball terms? Uh, it was right sure. through the uprights. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep going with those sports yeah, ball. The, the windage things. was That's great. Okay. Great. Yeah. So the question was, on the beloved animated sitcom The Jetsons, what catchphrase did Astro the dog use to describe how he felt about his owner? For bonus points, please spell your answer as Astro <laughs> pronounced it. We got no answers this <sighs> week, so we're going to let it ride for one more week, and we are doubling the points assigned to this and the cash prize. Yes, so, doubling it. So it's really worth your email now. Yes. And we also have a new trivia question, right, Ben? The new trivia question in the category of... Space operas. Question. The Millennium Falcon participated in the destruction of both Death Stars, first in 1977's Star Wars A New Hope, and later in 1983's Return of the Jedi. While the ship was present at both battles, its piloting team of Han Solo and Chewbacca were not. But there is one pilot who does appear in both battles. What is that pilot's name? The interruption. Yeah, this could do with some clarification. I meant just mentioned this question to my wife yesterday. She was very confused. She thought I was suggesting there was another person piloting the Millennium Falcon at both battles. No, this is a person who flew at both battles, but flew a ship that was separate from the Millennium Falcon. And this person who flew at both battles, but did not fly the Millennium Falcon, is mentioned by name in both movies. Back to the show. You can send your answers to centenary1911 at gmail.com. Story time, because the lockdown is boring. On to story time. And I'm going to commandeer the story time again today because people love my... St no, you're not. Brian. I'm taking over once again. It's a brijack. I'm brijacking it oh, back no. to me. So it is story time, and I'm going to tell a story. because This is Bryway robbery. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. It gets into the uh, bad uh, main topic. No, it gets into a very good main topic. Uh, so some of you may recognize this story from a sermon that I did many moons ago, and some of you have heard this in other venues, but... It's a significant experience of Brian being a total clueless buffoon, and that's always fun to I tell. I love so, those stories. So I recently uh, was in North Carolina with hanging out with some friends in a mountain house. I had done that before in 2009. I'd done that um, 
in the same area of North Carolina with the same group of friends. To get there, I had actually flown from Oakland to Nashville, and then I traveled across Tennessee and in the Carolina with a good friend of mine and flew back from Raleigh, North Carolina. I tell you these details because they're important to the story. So on Southwest, you get this opportunity to fly into one airport and fly out of another. So I was flying Oakland to Nashville. And being John Ralston's son, on that aircraft, I started talking with the person seated next to me. I did not have a guide dog at the time. This is just before I got Lansing, so I was on the flight by myself. Uh, no friendly companion canine, no Kathy. And so I was there talking to a stranger as I am wont to do at times. And often I get that feeling like someone doesn't really want to talk. And so I just kind of am polite and give them their space. They give me my space. This time the guy wanted to talk. And so we chatted, started having a very good conversation. He was fascinated by my disability, how I handled it, how I overcome it, the technology I used. And in the process, I find out all about his career in technology. He's an older man, maybe late 50s, early 60s, and uh, pretty successful in his career. He told me he was flying to New York and to do a bunch of things for his job. And so we had a lovely conversation. In the midst of that, I felt this little nudge from the Holy Spirit that I should talk about my faith. And I ignored it because I don't want to talk about my faith. I'm on vacation and I don't want to make this awkward. I got like a four-hour flight with this guy. So I ignore it. And we proceed to continue to talk. He asked me what I do for a living. Now, that's an interesting question for me <laughs> because I can fly the flag and say, I'm a pastor. I work at a church, all that. Or I can, I'm still, a nonprofit. I can still tell the truth and say I'm a counselor or I am a program director or I am a, and there are several other terms I can use. And yes, I work at a nonprofit. I can couch it and cloak what I do in those words. And that's what I did because I was again on vacation and feeling like I didn't want to make it awkward. I didn't want to bring up the church topic. And, you know, I just, I didn't want to, honestly, I just didn't feel like doing that. And so, yeah, I said I was a counselor and a program director and other things. We continued the talk, had a great conversation. And again, I keep feeling the nudge, just share with this man, tell him your story, share about your, about your testimony. I had many, many opportunities. I ignored them all and landed in Nashville, got off the flight. He was continuing on to New York. And as I met up with my friend, who's also a strong Christian, I immediately felt this conviction and this heaviness, like I had missed an opportunity. Hmm. And I was discouraged and kicking myself and dejected about my failure. And my friend actually had to talk me through that for like a day and a half. I hung on to it. Hmm. Um, but I managed to shake it and felt the forgiveness of God and the grace of the Lord covering me and managed to have a great vacation with my friends. Um, seven days later, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, sitting at my gate, waiting for my Southwest airline flight, just listening to uh, some podcast or something or other. And all of a sudden I feel this tap on my shoulder and someone says, Hey, Brian, fancy meeting you here. It was the same guy. Hmm. He had been delayed on his business trip in New York and rerouted on his flight home through Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, of all places. And he was on a flight from Raleigh, Durham to Phoenix, Arizona, and then on to Oakland, California, the same exact flight path as I was taking that day. And I thought to myself, okay, God, I get the message. The flight was delayed due to some issues. We got on the plane, ended up on Southwest. You can sit with whoever you want. So again, we we're seated next to each other. Hmm. And we resume this great conversation, this really good guy, he and I chat, and I'm thinking, okay, this is my opportunity. But once again, I feel the pressure of not bringing up the topic because, you know, by this point, I'm feeling bad that I didn't do it before. And now what am I going to do? Confess that I actually work at a church and I'm actually a pastor and I'm, I love Jesus and it's even more awkward now. And I don't take advantage of any, any opportunities that I get. Again, he's asking wow. me deep questions about how I handle my disability. He's asking me where I get the courage and the strength that I need to do the things I do. He's asking me about my educational background. I had so many opportunities and ignored them all. Because once again, though I was feeling the pressure from the Holy Spirit, I didn't want to go there and make it awkward. We land in Phoenix. We're running late. He actually offers to help me change planes because the assistance that I usually uh, take advantage of is going to be delayed and it's going to take a while. I'm probably going to miss the connecting flight. He and I actually dash through Phoenix Airport, make it to the, the flight. They're closing up the, 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 uh, the, the flight and we barely make it on. And the flight attendant says, I'm really sorry, there aren't two seats together. And so basically we have to separate. So she seats me in the front and he has to go on back to the back of the plane. So I think that's it. You know, I've lost, lost the chance. And once again, I'm dealing with regret and remorse and everything else. 
sit down on the seat, pull across this, the seat belt to fasten it, and the whole thing breaks loose from the seat that it's attached to. The metal actually was <laughs> faulty. It had, and I literally pull the seat belt off the seat. It literally is in my hands. And I, being Brian, try to hide this fact from the flight attendant and think, I, I don't I don't want to make trouble. I don't. Just, yeah. Is this right before the great fish comes out of the water and swallows So at this you? point, I'm going, okay, God, please, I, I just, just let me not die in a plane crash or anything. And okay, Lord, I get it. Yeah, I'm looking for fish. I'm looking for, you know. And the flight attendant says, sir, I'm sorry, I can't let you sit in that seat. It's not safe. It's not, you know. And there is one open seat in the back. I'm going to have to move you. It's all the way in the last row. It's the middle seat. It's the one that doesn't recline. It's right next to the restroom. (laughs) And I'm like, okay. And guess who's seated on the aisle when I get back there? It's my friend Ron, who I've now sat with on three different flights. This will be the third. And once again, the Holy Spirit is kicking me in the head going, do you get what I want you to do yet? Are you willing to surrender yet? Or are you going to be stubborn yet again? Because... We could make arrangements for you to sit in the restroom for this flight if you want. Um, So, yes, we take off, and I finally, finally, I don't even remember how I got into it, but I just kind of went, you know what, Ron, I I need to share a little bit more about my story, a little bit more about who I am, and I pour out the whole thing. And we have a great conversation. He responds very favorably. He doesn't fall on his knees and receive Jesus, and there isn't some choir singing just as I am in the back of the plane. (laughs) It's not that kind of moment, but we have a great conversation about the difference between relationship and religion, and we have a great conversation, and and I tell my story, and I don't necessarily, you know, win him for Jesus, but by the end of the flight, he shakes my hand, and he says, I'm really thankful we got to have this last talk. He goes, this means a lot to me, and he said, you give me a lot to think about, and we exchange email addresses, and I do find out that he and his wife ended up going back to church. They had been a part of a church decades earlier. They ended up going back to church. Um, I don't know what happened, honestly, Mm. but I felt finally that I had obeyed the Lord and, yeah, that I did what I was supposed to do. And, again, I think I was just part of a process, and God wanted me to to keep this divine appointment. And even when I failed twice um, in pretty spectacular ways, he kept giving me the opportunity and made it very clear this is what he wanted me to do. So I tell you that story because I think it's important to understand Divine appointments are a real thing. They happen. And I think sometimes this big dramatic one is what we kind of expect. But that's not always the way it works. In my case, this is just one famous story that of my failure and how God continued to be faithful to me even when I was unfaithful to him and gave me other opportunities. I think we get these kind of opportunities regularly, though. So, yeah. Questions, comments, complaints? I think we should move on to our main topic. Main topic. Main topic. Topic. Which is divine appointments. Oh, it's related in some way. That's Yeah, crazy. isn't that neat? We planned that and everything. Isn't that cool? So yeah, it's divine appointments is the concept. And this is something that I see throughout the scriptures. And I think it's a pretty amazing reality that sometimes God arranges um, people cross your path at various times in various ways. Sometimes in a very spectacular fashion. Other times in a very ordinary, everyday kind of fashion. But I think if we learn to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the leadings of the Holy Spirit, I think we'll see more often these kind of divine appointments that God puts in our life. And it's not the big dramatic, you're going to lead someone to Jesus every time, but it's the idea that you get to be a part of someone else's spiritual journey. And even if it's moving them just a slight increment closer to knowing Jesus, that's an amazing thing. Or if you can just be the one Christian with whom they have a good experience, that's a great thing. So... The concept of divine appointments. What do you think, Ben? Um, it, a couple things. You said that that story was, you know, the the big spectacular one. We can't always expect the big spectacular one. I, I don't hear that and think big spectacular. I think this sounds inconvenient. This isn't what you want to do right now. Like God yeah. was talking to you and nudging you in what for you or for what an ordinary person is, is a very mundane experience. And we just don't want to be bothered with it. And I think... It'd be easier if all those divine appointments were these spectacular moments where the rivers parted and the Red Sea, you know, turned into two walls of water. And, oh, that's the guy. Well, clearly, God, I will follow you. But uh, how many times on this podcast have you said small choices every day? Yeah, yeah. That's and, a great clarification. Yeah. Small yeah. choices every day. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you talking about that story, like, I hear the victory just in the obedience. And I think obedience in those situations is the important part, not the visible results. Like, 
okay, God, you've been nudging me on the shoulder. You've been nudging me. You've been nudging me on the shoulder. Why didn't the guy drop down on his knees and confess his sin and, <laughs> and you know, declare his... Why didn't he immediately sell his house the next day and go be a missionary in Africa? Well, God is not beholden to us to show us the results of the work. Right. We are beholden to him to be obedient in the moment. And, you know, the visible results, that's his domain. Right, right. And we often forget that. We often want uh, to be a part of something where we see it from start to finish. And that's rarely what happens. Most of the time, God just wants you to be part of a process, a journey for someone else. And then you get the blessing of being obedient. And the blessings that come with that are pretty astounding. But really, the the fruit belongs to the Lord. The harvest belongs to God. Our job is to plant seeds or to water seeds or to do whatever it takes to kind of be a part of that process, but we're not necessarily going to be the one who gets the harvest or gets to to see the end results. Sometimes, yes, but majority of the time, no. Your job is just to be a part of the process. And the idea of being a witness is not being a prosecuting attorney. You don't have to convince someone to believe from mm. start to finish. Your job is just to share what you've experienced, your story, what you've seen and heard. And over and over again in scriptures, that's really all that it comes down to is God puts someone in your path to love them, to show them kindness, to share your story, whatever it may be. And that's, that's your faithfulness is all that's required. And there's so much evidence in scripture of the seeming mundane nature of these divine appointments too. Like Brian, what are some of your favorite examples? Yeah. So the one, the one I love uh, probably where I first came across this concept is in Acts chapter eight. And it's the story of Philip who is a deacon in the early church He's identified in Acts 6 as one of the deacons, and he's just an ordinary dude. He's not one of the— He's not Peter. He's not Paul. No, he's not one of the big evangelists. He's not one of the big disciples, apostles. He is—but God uses him in some pretty amazing ways. He, uh, God arranges for him just so happens to be along a road that goes south out of Jerusalem at just the right time when an Ethiopian official is traveling along, and Philip just kind of happens to be— able to walk alongside and the man's doesn't carriage. Doesn't say like the guy is just sitting there and he goes, gosh, I wish somebody could explain this yeah. passage of scripture to me. So the scripture is great because the Ethiopian uh, official is reading aloud from the book of Isaiah. And just in an aside is like, gee, I really wish somebody was around to explain this to me as Philip is walking beside his carriage. And so God just arranges this little meeting and Philip is faithful enough to say, hello, pull over, let me hop on board, and I can explain some of that Isaiah stuff to you. And here we go. And within a few uh, miles, the Ethiopian uh, official is ready to, un to confess faith in Christ and is basically saying, there's water, why, why, can't, why can't I, can't be, I baptized? be baptized? <laughs> yeah. And he's basically, so Philip in that situation was the final uh, step God used him, but that's a clear example of divine appointment because God arranged that in so many different ways. And then as soon as the appointment's over, Philip miraculously is, is kind of whisked away to another place in a cool move of teleportation um, But because the appointment's over. And the Ethiopian eunuch is able to go on and we think he takes the gospel back to his home country. And years later, there's actually a church that's that was pretty strong in Ethiopia. So... That's a fun little church history fact, but that divine appointment is in Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 26, and it's a pretty fun little story, and it's one of many kind of episodes of such things in scriptures. Fun fact, I love uh, the name some other Bible translations assigned to Ethiopia. Is it the land of Cush? Cush. Yeah, yeah it's Cush, He's the Cushite. Man. He's the Cushite, dude. That's yeah. such a uh, Keanu Reeves stoner kind of name, so... Why can't I be baptized? <laughs> so, yeah, the, if you read through Scripture, you'll see these kind of things happening on a regular basis where God arranges just coincidentally um, for a meeting that takes place sometimes just to start faith, sometimes to continue, um, you know, the process, and other times to bring someone across the finish line into faith. One of my favorite um, examples, not necessarily, well, one of my favorite appointments of this type in scripture is in the book of Mark with the, the woman that had been bleeding for 12 years. Yeah. And that's such a spectacular story on its own. The way he treats her, he calls her daughter. You know, she's ceremonially unclean. He notices her in the crowd. Oh my gosh, who touched me? What are you talking about? There's a whole crowd pressing, pressing around you. How can you say who touched you? 
but it's so easy to forget that Jesus w- was actually busy at the moment. Yeah. Um, he had been approached by somebody of wealth and importance, or at least importance in the community. Um, he was on his way to go heal the, was J- it? Jairus's daughter. Yeah. yeah. So Jairus, a uh, high official in the synagogue, mm-hmm. had basically come to Jesus and asked, out uh, of desperation, come and heal my daughter. She's dying. And Jesus agrees to do that. So he's on the way for a fairly urgent uh, situation. And from a human standpoint, this yeah. is the kind of maneuver that can give your movement some some uh, momentum. Yeah. This is, you know, this is a way to go public with an important person who is connected, who can, you know, th- from a human standpoint, that's that's the move. Right. Like, holy cow, we've been waiting for this moment. This leader wants you to heal his daughter. You know, this will look great on Facebook. Yeah, it would have made the evening news So many time. retweets. But, but he stops and he has this encounter which takes some time with this woman who is unclean who is an exile from her own community because of her unclean status. And she is violating so many rules by being out in a crowd and by touching this religious leader. And and yet Jesus gives her attention and he gives her focus and he gives her love and he treats her in a way that is very respectful. And he has this divine appointment and gives her her life back, essentially, in a very public way. You want to talk about he's busy and he's in, and this is inconvenient. The daughter dies. Yeah. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> I mean, she's okay after that, you know. Cause, but, but while yeah. the, the text is so it's fascinating. It's not a good time. It's yeah. Mark 5, and literally it says, while the teacher is speaking, while Jesus is still speaking to the woman, the servants come from Jairus' house and say, basically, don't bother Jesus anymore. Your daughter's dead. And in that moment. It's it's really easy for us to talk about this isn't a good time. Yeah. Like, that, that time was worse. Yeah. 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 And so that's an episode where Jesus obviously is is sovereign and knowing what he's going to do, regardless of whether the daughter is dead or not. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. But Jesus uh, gives the attention needed to the woman and then goes to Jairus and basically says, I, I haven't forgotten you. I'm going to keep my divine appointment with you as well because, you know, that's already in the works. But the point is Jesus himself keeps these divine appointments that were arranged, I, I think, in a way that is pretty unusual and pretty awesome for, for for us to see that Jesus himself is keeping this. So do we doubt that God would do that for us? God the Father would do that for us as well. And so between the Holy Spirit, God the Father arranging these, I think there's there's that happens on all, all the time for us as well. Jesus right before, so that's Mark chapter 5. The beginning of that chapter, Jesus himself actually traveled across the Sea of Galilee for one purpose only, to meet this man who's in terrible straits, demon-possessed, and in this horrible situation, living in a graveyard. And Jesus goes way out of his way just to meet that man, free him from his demons, bring him to to faith. And that whole story at the beginning of Mark 5 is yet another divine appointment that Jesus keeps in a pretty uh, intentional way. So Jesus does this. I think it's it's a biblical concept that's important for us to be aware of. Um, and the Holy Spirit will point those out to you. And like I said, faithfulness is all that's needed from us. I think so often we feel the pressure to, I know I did. I was on vacation back at that long story I told earlier. I was on vacation. I felt all this pressure that I would have to be something that I didn't feel like being or some super champion of the faith. And I was going to have to, you know, put on my Billy Graham disguise. You have and, to be able to answer every possible question yeah, that you come up with. Yeah. Or even for you in your case, like you were, it was harder the second time God tapped you on the shoulder because yeah. you'd already failed the first time. Yeah. You know, how are you going to respond if he says, well, why didn't you tell me this when I was asking you all these deep questions before? Right. And and shame is a tricky monster in that sometimes we're paralyzed by our previous failures and we're sh- ashamed and we think that that has disqualified us. And God's kind of going, no, I've forgiven you for that. Now get back up on your feet and and here's your next opportunity. But we humans get mm. bound by shame and we get kind of chained down by our previous mistakes and we hold on to them a lot more than we should. And so sometimes it just means I got to be honest enough to start over and and forgive myself because God has already forgiven me. God already forgave me for those previous failures. I hadn't forgiven myself and I was embarrassed and I thought, you know, I was too worried about what this guy thought of me. And so, yeah, I was bound up by shame in a way that that prevented me from taking a second opportunity. So God had to give me a third opportunity. So yeah, uh, look for this in scripture. It shows up in a number of ways in the ministries of Jesus. And then also the ministry you see in Paul, Peter, throughout the book of Acts. Uh, And it's just a fascinating time 
to look for those. And then, then I think take from that the idea that God still does this today. And look for those little opportunities where God might be putting someone on your mind. And during a pandemic, it's not necessarily possible to get together in person, but you sure can call or drop a card or, you know, there's different things you can do. So divine appointments are still happening even more so probably now during a pandemic that someone just needs a loving uh, message, a loving word, and a caring action, checking in on someone who's, who's on their own. Just look for those divine appointments that God may bring across your, your path. One last word before we go. So closing today, just want to remind you that God is in control, even if sometimes it doesn't feel like that, and that the Holy Spirit is guiding you. If you are a Christian, you are uh, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and learning to listen to that still small voice is important. And so get in the Word, get in prayer, connect with the Lord through worship and other ways that you do, and then let the Holy Spirit be your guide. And yeah, so that's a really important reminder for us today. And then want to remind you to stay in touch with us. And so send us an email, let us know you're listening, let us know if you have any questions or topic suggestions, or if you have any discussion points for us, please get in touch. Answer the trivia. And um, we've got all these on-campus activities coming up. Remember, this Sunday, October 25th, services at 9 and 11 a.m. on campus. For those of you that aren't ready for that yet, the online services will continue almost indefinitely. The service itself launches at 9 a.m., on YouTube, and each of those worship packages premiere at 8.45 a.m. on YouTube, so you can watch one, then the other. Um, there will be the traditional hymn sing-along this coming Sunday at 5.30 p.m., and that Halloween walk-through carnival on October 31st. We need candy. We need volunteers. We'd love to see you there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.